This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I had an amazing lady called Rosie Ferguson come in and have a chat. She is the CEO of the House and Barnabas. If you don't know, it's an amazing charity that seeks to break the cycle of homelessness and they have a members club in Soho Square and they have an amazing employment academy where they get people in who need help to find a job, training, interview practice, you know, all of that cool stuff. We hear a lot about the House in Barnabas. We discuss the main topics and issues around homelessness at the moment in the UK and what we can do to help have an impact. Yeah, hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Boom, and we're live. Rosie, thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. You've been a CEO for the House of Barnas for what, Coming June? up for three months, so I'm very new. Okay, uh, yeah. Still learning, but getting to grips with things. Nice, nice. And what were you doing before? So I was previously Chief Executive of Gingerbread, the National Charity of Single Parents, and before that I was Chief Executive of London Youth, the network of youth clubs across London. So I've kind of always been in the charity sector and seen some of the same problems that people face in society, like from yeah. from different perspectives, if you like, from the kind of young people from the family and now from the perspective of homelessness. So it's really interesting. Very interesting. Uh, yeah. How Did you always want to be working in the charity sector? Or how did it yeah, all start? Yeah, it was kind of, as with most people's careers, you, it's not so much a definite choice as like you kind of you do the next thing that seems interesting and then yeah. before you know it your networks and your the opportunities that come are in the thing that you started in I think I always had a sense of passion that inequality was wrong yeah. and that it was important to give people who didn't have opportunities to enjoy their life and be the best they can be so that I think that was probably quite instinctive and then I, nice. I kind of followed that and initially I started out in youth work so yeah. supporting young people to did you went to university I did yeah I went to Goldsmiths yeah. and then cool. I started volunteering while I was at Goldsmiths Smith supporting kind of youth volunteering and giving young people the chance to volunteer overseas and do things nice. that are fun and I uh, did a bit of kind of campaigning and and then yeah started doing that as a job and then my kind of career progressed from Crazy. there. So. Um, so what's the route then from volunteering to running a charity? I mean I think volunteering is something that I carry on doing so I yeah. think volunteering is, is a starting point but it's also a kind of lifestyle so I'm now on a number of boards and carry on volunteering with different things it's, it's kind of ingrained if you Great. like. And yeah. I think for me, the opportunity to, you know, get into my first role in youth work and then I was lucky to get promoted. I mean, a lot of it is luck, isn't it, in life? But yeah, well, I, you but put yourself in the scenario, don't you? Yeah, I mean... You've still got to make the right choices and work hard and... Yeah, I did you know. do... So I did a Master's in Voluntary Sector Management at Coast okay. Business School, which right. was really good in terms of getting the rigour and discipline of how to run a charity to couple with yeah. kind of passion and enthusiasm. Was that straight after... Uni or kind of during No, it was a few years bit. later, yeah, yeah, yeah. As I was, yeah, while I was working full time, yeah. Did you find that, that useful? It was great, yeah, yeah. It was really good. I think careers in the charity sector, I mean, I was lucky to have investment of great people. There yeah. isn't as much uh, resources to spend on people development so you have to be a little bit more entrepreneurial in the way that you access it yeah kind yeah. of you know I spent time going out and shadowing chief execs who I admired kind of reaching out and building yourself a, a network and um, yeah. taking essentially grabbing any opportunity that you can nice. um, to do more and to kind of take on more responsibility yeah, that's true we actually did um, we spoke about it in the office yesterday about taking responsibility for your own learning yeah because a lot of the time people rely on their companies you know send them on training courses yeah. and, and those things there's so many cool like uh, e-learning platforms yeah, Coursera absolutely. and I think you've got to take charge like you've done yeah and most of know. most of my learning hasn't come from training courses it's come from getting myself in situations where I'm out of my comfort zone or yeah, meeting yeah. people who stretch and challenge you and I think yeah that, that for me is exciting yeah. and from just jumping in the deep end and doing something you're not 100% sure you it's can do it's the best do. way being uncomfortable being comfortable being uncomfortable yeah is yeah. when you really start to learn yeah yeah and I really agree with that how did you get involved with the House of St Barnabas so I was looking for my next kind of challenge yeah. and and I'd been to the house a number of times um, over the years and just thought it was, I think, the combination of the social enterprise and the, the kind of unique way of working, you know, in partnership in a kind of corporate environment, but for good, yeah, but also yeah. coupled with you know a really important mission around breaking the cycle of homelessness and the need you know absolutely critical need and the services that it offers being you know really high quality 
I think the third thing is I just thought it'd be quite good fun. And, yeah, it's a great uh, spot. That's turned out to be true. It's a really good spot. So what was the, what's the history? So it was so it became a members club. Was it five or six years ago? Or? Yeah, absolutely. So the house was built um, back in the seventeenth century. Yeah. So and for those that don't know, this is number one Greek Street on Soho Square. Uh, yeah. In eighteen forty six, it, it was gifted to set up as a charity. Oh, right. To and interestingly, to do two things: one, to help the kind of poor and destitute of London, but secondly, to help help wealthy people with disciplined philanthropy so help wealthy people spend their money well to support the poor and then for kind of well over a century it's then been various guises of homeless charity and hostel and uh, mainly folks supporting women it closed about 10 years slightly more ago and when the kind of standards expected around hostels quite rightly raised and it no longer met those standards right um it actually housed people and it housed people yeah so for a long time it was a kind of hostel for for destitute women essentially and there's all sorts of stories in that as you can imagine yeah yeah. um and then i think it so it reopened as a private members club six years ago right and for me it kind of returns full circle to that thing of how do you combine supporting people who've experienced homelessness and who really need a leg up but at the same time with the private members club we're also supporting people who've who are reasonably wealthy and want to but want to spend their money well and want to kind of enjoy their enjoy themselves but also make a difference while they're doing it and so i feel like we've come full circle in terms of what the charity was originally set up So so how does that work then people can join the members club Spend their money, restaurant, bar, all of those things. And then I know you have a, an employment academy. Yeah. So so the people who've gone through the employment academy then get a job at the house? Not quite, I'll, but kind of. So the employment academy, I'll start with there. The employment academy supports people who've experienced homelessness um, and we support them to secure good work that will give them kind of lasting security, a good home, somewhere where they, they feel comfortable and they're safe and they can stay, and a good network. So a network of people that will, will support them if things go wrong. Um, they're the things that we need. We, we believe people need to genuinely break the cycle of homelessness rather than to just get into a short, you know, kind of be on the roller coaster where you're kind of okay for a bit and then as soon as something goes wrong you fall back into uh, rough sleeping yeah, or yeah, whatever yeah. so that's our mission we work with people initially for 12 weeks um, supporting them to I think regain a bit of dignity is one of the main things that we do so we, we support yeah. people with employment so we give them they do training in the members club for, yeah. for 10 weeks of work experience but we also support them with their kind of housing with oh, their kind of mental health with support them by you know taking them to galleries that's giving them access to concerts they get a mentor from the membership and then after their 12 weeks finish we have a graduation and then we support them on going for a year to right. make sure that they progress into work progress into home but then beyond that progress into a career and a home that are going to provide them the kind of security and lifestyle that they yeah, want yeah. to live so it's a very holistic program the way that the club plays in that yeah is it's a training ground for those participants so they do their 10 week work experience both in the bar and kitchen and yeah. um but also in the office in in our events team in our art team in our pr team nice they also become mentors and uh, oh, for, for the next for the participants yeah. no so the the members of club members, oh, members can become right. mentors for yeah. participants we also hope and i think this is a kind of aspiration for me in the future that the house can also be a kind of convening space in terms of conversations about how we break the cycle of homelessness and how yeah. we to bring different down. people together because we have a membership of people across you know government creatives tech people uh, charity sector how do we bring our, our community together with different disciplines to think about how we can you know how we can all together uh, tackle some of the challenges that cause homelessness no, I think it's, it's awesome because I, I speak to a lot of companies and, and all the co- all companies you know we want to help and they often help by donating money when it comes to giving them a job however yeah people are very you know cautious about hiring someone who might have had a drug problem might have been an alcoholic yeah. might have been sleeping rough on the street so you know everyone talks about we love to help people but when it comes down to like actually giving them a job you, you find there's a little bit of a disconnect which I find quite interesting yeah and it is I mean I think one thing that has really struck me since starting this role is that you kind of have when someone says homeless person or person who's experienced homeless you have an image in your head of who that person is um, and the first day that I walked into the employment academy and met all of the participants 
it kind of struck me like, oh, these are just ordinary people. These are not, you know, these are people who've had bad luck and who've had a range of different. But but by the time they come to us, then they're no longer rough sleeping, so they need so they've had some support to get them. If they have been rough sleeping, they've had support to get them into, uh, and they are clean currently. So yeah. now that doesn't mean that they don't have all sorts of vulnerabilities and and backgrounds. But actually, they are they're not necessarily young people, so they're of all ages, and they are yeah. as a group, they're a kind of confident articulate characterful bunch and certainly when you can see standing in that room how many how much employability skills there are definitely we actually ran uh, this was a few years ago one of uh, a session uh, for the employment academy Ooh. before you were ceo how was that um well so it was great so we five of us went and we were running a course on uh, cv writing oh, great. Uh, helping to write cover sheets and then methods for applying for a job yeah great and uh, so i had in my mind before i went for some reason i thought everyone would be i don't know young um, and then I got there and I think the average there must have been 15 to 20 people and I think the average age must have been like mid to late 40s yeah. and you were like wow and then and then you realise when people decide they want to share their story with you and you're chatting and you're helping with their CV and stuff that like no one's very far away from no, homelessness I mean you could lose your job you've got a mortgage you can't pay you've got all of these other exactly. expenses and suddenly you know and people have had whole lives and careers and then for whatever reason, whether it's relationship breakdown or, I mean, illness, mental illness is a huge cause of, of homelessness or people being a carer for a family member and then, you know, what for whatever reason, your kind of circumstances change. And then if yeah. you don't have that financial and, and kind of supportive network, you just can fall through the cracks very easily. 100%. And then it's like, you know, this kind of downward spiral mentally. And then the other big thing I find is the stigma attached to someone who's been homeless or being an alcoholic and stuff, mm. and also the stigma they attach to themselves, which then stops them kind of getting the, the job they might want. And yeah, it's a tough one. What do you do for like clothing and stuff? So if they want to go for like an interview and they don't is there like are there so we have a couple of partners actually who donate oh, okay. um, clothing so there's, yeah. there's a I mean I've just completed my first programme so I've just oh, been cool. there been there so the graduation is next week so I've just seen one programme through and there's a day about kind of a few weeks in when a clothes there's a kind of loads of women's clothes donated and, and men's kind of suits and waistcoats and the like and you suddenly there's a kind of scramble in one of the rooms while everyone's oh, trying to find the clothes that they like and then, yeah. and then suddenly all of the people who've been in the first few weeks of the program are really glamorous and in really good clothes <laughs> and that's fantastic to see and you actually see that I mean obviously clothes are superficial but they can also they can also lift people's dignity a bit and, definitely you and it's great. fantastic You're, to see that, yeah. that you know to see that transition of people from when they first walk in the door yeah. and the clothes is just one example but how they feel and also I think like House of Malibus is an amazing building. They're it's working pretty, in an yeah, environment building, which is, yeah. you know, Dickens wrote a tale of two cities there. You know, Gladstone's been there. Basil Jet's been there. You know, it's an amazing. We have celebrities coming through. It's a, it's an amazing environment to be in, and you can't be in there and not feel proud. And yeah, yeah, so yeah, we really try to make sure that they feel part of that community and that they're, yeah. and that that hopefully that pride. Um, I think is part of the magic of what we do. Definitely. How impactful has your first employment academy been? Do, do you measure? kind of how long they or how many get jobs and how long they stay and these kind of things so it's my first one that I've been Your through it's, right, the, it's, it's the kind of, I think yeah. it's the 16th programme yeah, that yeah. the house has run yeah so I think it's about two thirds of people getting to work as a, following the programme which awesome. compared to other I need to check my stats on that I think yeah. it's about um, but compared to other comparative programmes that's a really strong outcome so I think it is successful what we've noticed is the challenges with the programme to date they've been really good at supporting people into their first job yeah. but what happens is they're still in entry level kind of early stage roles often zero hours contracts often below oh, the living right. wage oh. so how do we then so now our new our new strategy focuses on good work good home right. and good network so how do we really get people work that they're going to enjoy yeah. uh, that is going to pay them enough to live a decent and basic standard of living or yeah. more yeah. Um, that has a kind of decent commute the, where there's progression opportunities so I think we're focusing less on let's just get people into work and actually how do we support them to really progress and, and achieve security. And is it at the moment mostly like hospitality type roles? Uh, it's a lot in hospitality because that's our kind of base. And work. So on yeah. the programme, 50% do their work placement in hospitality and 50% don't do others. We have quite a few hospitality partners, which is great. We are really keen to have partners. What what we really need yeah. is is role administrative roles, um, more, more businesses, kind of parks administration. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. the, what we'd like to do is support people to progress into roles that they're passionate about. Yeah. Administrative roles are really... Um, so businesses around the city here 
absolutely they need to get if, um, yeah absolutely there's um, both as you know the way as employers but actually if that feels like too big a first step uh, then just becoming a corporate member of House St Barnabas yeah. um, or an individual member and you kind of become part of the community and then there's loads of ways to, to help Awesome what, what what other avenues are there available for them for, for help? There's a kind of complex landscape of support for people who are experiencing homelessness when somebody is first homeless or first rough sleeping um, the first thing they should do is go to their local authority and the local authority does have a duty to support them How do they support them? So so the local authority should try to get them into a hostel. First of all, there are hostel facilities. Um, there's also the street. And they're free, are they the hostel? So the local authority pay for uh, so for them it's free for too. a hostel. Yeah. yeah. So it's so it's free for the person, but they might be a waiting list. It might take them time to get. The, I mean, they should be they should be housed in that yeah. period of time. Um, if they're if they're a resident in that local authority and they kind of comply with um the requirements, but obviously right. a lot of people who find themselves homeless are you know having problems with alcohol or substance abuse or have mental health issues so often there's there's some very acute support that people need that means they're they need additional support just to access the basic services so so yes in theory you know there should be help for everybody who's experiencing homelessness yeah. the reality is that there aren't enough resources the the um, support is targeted often the way that services work is they're targeted at one thing so this is go and see this person about your housing go and see this person about your mental health go and see this person about your substance abuse right. but actually we, and this is a similar thing so there's no like holistic kind of uh, and that's what we try to do really right. build and that, that's similar from my experience of working with young people you know if, if yeah. a young person's having difficult they'll be put on a gangs program or on a on a um, antisocial behaviour program or, or a dyslexia whereas actually what they what young people need is exactly the same as any human beings we need yeah. confidence we need love we need a network of people who are going to back us yeah. kindness. Uh, we need kindness yeah. and we need opportunity to to be given responsibility and show that we can and have people around us believe in us so yeah. uh, that's often our services aren't designed to give people that kind of opportunity and that's what we give to our own friends and family that we love to enable them to succeed but that doesn't always um that doesn't always kind of that's not always reflected into a way that the state understandably delivers services Ah, so so there's not like a kind of like one point of contact style so there is street link so if you see somebody sleeping rough who you think might be vulnerable or who who needs support you can report that to street link and they will uh, kind of identify and and provide support to anybody sleeping rough so that's something that any member of the uh, public charity or i think it's a coordinated network across local authorities and i think it's coordinated between a number of agencies so there's also a huge number of charities providing support um for people who are kind of first of all rough sleeping and then uh, there's like new horizons in in um Houston that provides support oh, okay. for young people who are sleeping rough in, in London. You've got Connections and Martins. Uh, awesome. So like where people who are sleeping rough have places to go where they can get immediate support. We tend to take referrals from those organisations so at the point that... Oh, okay, so, so they go to them and then, They go to them yeah. and they'll support them with their kind of very basic needs, getting somewhere to sleep, getting clean, getting... Um, and then hopefully getting them into a hostel, helping them interact with their local authority. And then they'll be passed on to us at the point that they're a little bit more stable and ready to kind of rebuild some of the other aspects of their life. Awesome. And then they'll have somewhere to be to be li- to living to be living as well at yeah, that moment so yeah. about a third of our participants are in um hostels yeah. about by the time ta- by the time that they reach us about a third are in hostels but a third have secured uh, local authority housing but that might be short term or so they've kind of got themselves a tenancy yeah. and about a third are living in kind of sofa surfing or in overcrowded accommodation so they're not rough sleeping right um but they are you know, their, their housing is, continues to be vulnerable, but they've yeah. kind of made a bit of that journey um, in terms of moving them. So they've got somewhere to sleep and somewhere to shower. And How long can you stay in a hostel for? Interesting. So I've, I've been around to visit some hostels as part of my induction. I think in most of them, they have a kind of one year, two year um, maximum. But then some yeah. people, some people will come in and out within a few weeks because actually they need a bit of support to reconnect with their family or to right, move, yeah. you know, other people will, will stay for longer if it's difficult to move them on. I think we don't have good enough mental health services so often people with yeah. high mental health support needs can be in a hostel for a long time because actually what they really need is intensive mental health support but that is very difficult to come by so yeah, yeah. so that's when people often yeah they're not really able to live alone yeah. and yet they don't reach the threshold to have uh, to be kind of hospitalized or have uh, okay. or have intensive mental health support so that's often Just when people the, can end up can about. end up staying in hostels for a very long time yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, is there is there um, been an increase in homelessness the last five or so years or is it been fairly kind of consistent in fair? I think certainly the 
Um, I mean, as I mean, poverty is increasing in the UK and, and the kind of vulnerability. I, the, I think most people who live in London can see that over the last few years, rough sleeping has increased significantly, certainly yeah, where yeah. I live. Yeah, it's uh, it's much more visible than it was 10 years yeah. ago. I think the other challenge is that kind of the nature of poverty is changing. And now in, in what work, way? I think poverty used to be the kind of historical understanding of poverty is people who were unemployed and who weren't working. I think now yeah. most people who are living in the poverty of the UK are actually working. And it's people who might be kind of working three jobs, zero yeah, hours yeah, contracts, yeah. minimum wage, you know, single parents, people who are you know carers, anyone with a kind of vulnerability yeah, who yeah. Um, who is working could be working three different jobs and still not able to. And the you know the cost of housing, the cost of um, the cost of living means that they're still not able to feed their kids or feed themselves at the end of the month. You know the increasing access of food banks is a result of that. So actually, the people who are vulnerable. Um, are kind of shifting um, and quite different people finding their, yeah. themselves in situations that they might not have done. I, I, I tend to see a lot more men on the streets, but I have seen, I don't know if it's true or not, but I've seen a, a few more women over the years. Interesting. Often women don't choose to be, so if women are homeless, they, they are, they're more vulnerable on the streets yeah. than men are. Obviously men are also, anybody who's sleeping on the streets is vulnerable. But if women are find themselves homeless, they're more likely to prioritise getting into a hostel or to find somewhere oh, okay. to sleep on a sofa or to where men are, are less vulnerable on the streets. So it, it is a, a lower number of women, I think. It doesn't mean that often when women are homeless, it's because there they might be leaving an abusive relationship or they might be so the the kind of circumstances within which people become homeless are slightly different there's, there's some kind of okay. gender impacts there and also the kind of choice around where you choose to where you choose to sleep for the night yeah, depending yeah. on where you feel the safest yeah yeah interesting so so overall it's kind of maybe a similar amount that are in the similar vulnerable position yeah and maybe the avenues they can choose yeah to absolutely and often if there's children involved then it's women who end up having the children so you often see a lot of single men in hostels because um, it's more likely that a woman with children will get housed quicker oh, than yeah. um, than someone without yeah it's, if you've got children you, you get housed quicker yeah, so. So, there's, so there's kind of um, you know there's there's vulnerabilities on both sides really but our programme we work with the gender the gender split is equal so oh. we so on um, the employment academy you have yes yeah, so it's about 50 50 um oh, okay. male female yeah and, and, and the age range is, is yeah, older as you is say that, it's yeah. kind of i mean i think on the current program the youngest is kind of mid-20s right. and the oldest is in their 50s so it's, it's a real span and, yeah. and that also creates a real family and, you, and, and, and you, are you facilitating the kind of network of you know they're meeting these people on the employment academy and they can start to kind of foster some friendships yeah so there's I mean the, the team who deliver the employment academy are great and they're very much focused on how do you really build a how do you really build a strong supportive network for each other so there's a lot of work done on kind of a lot of group work around their aspirations and how they they develop their confidence and their and that involves them kind of being vulnerable with each other and developing that kind of trust and support network that I imagine having seen yeah. the kind of intensity of the experience that will you know there'll be some friendships there that, that last forever and then we also so hope that the, the community of the club is built into that as well that um so they have a mentor who will also um support them and they they become kind of part of the house of st barnabas family if you like. that's great so as a member you can fill out a form and hopefully mentor someone yeah, yeah. absolutely i need to do that uh, oh yes please do i know i definitely will i've been planning on doing it for ages and i actually need to do it. it's on my goals list in january uh, fill out the form and then go for it excellent i mean it's a really powerful way to give support to someone 100%. Who, yeah. yeah and you get and you learn too i think um i think the moment i met with a mentor this week she's now not working and her mentee is and so oh, the, right, <laughs> so the, the, the mentee <laughs> the participants now progressed into work and the and the mentor is between jobs and he's, he's obviously still supporting the mentee but yeah. actually there's some you know the positive, relationship you'll find a job soon exactly <laughs> the, the relationship is two way and and um you know that we can all learn things from from each other can't we yeah no being a mentor and the mentorship relationship is really interesting a lot of there's been a big increase in that and even you know in the world of uh, of work and i think everyone it's useful for everyone to have a mentor whatever level yeah. you are in your career it's always nice to just chat to someone who's maybe not as connected with your job Absolutely. Or situation yeah. as, as normal what can people do to get involved if they're not a member and they're keen to to support in some way uh, 
to become a member we ask yes. that you have a commitment to social impact and you pay the membership uh, so yeah if you apply it's uh, 700 pounds for a membership so it's actually for the fabulous place that it is reasonably yes. yeah. um, good value and corporate membership as well so you can you can join as a company awesome. um, mentoring is open to non-members as well so oh, if okay, you want right. to be a member right. then you can access that you can also we have loads of art which is for sale the people art's can, awesome people can yeah. donate and fundraise for us if they want to yeah and you can't you can't come in to the house unless you're a member so we do have a number of events um right. that are open to the public so friday nights we have kind of phonica we have a number of uh, dj nights church. in the yeah we have concerts in the church so there's a number of events that non-members can can buy okay. tickets for yeah. yeah so so if you want to come and have a look around the place before you commit then uh, you, can, you can come we'll put to um event. we'll put the various links on the show notes so people can click through to the website oh great and uh and get involved so and then you on Twitter, Instagram, all of that stuff. We are, absolutely. House St. Barnabas, yeah. Awesome. Cool, well, thank you so much. It's been really lovely to speak to you. Thank you. And I will see you around the club and keep up all the good work. Brilliant, thanks a lot. Thank you. Cheers. Hey, folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. Bye.